If you have your Bibles with you, you can turn a while to the book of Judges. We're going to be speaking out of chapter 4, verses 4 through 24 today. A little longer scripture than normal. And an interesting scripture, as you'll see as we read through it. It can be a little graphic at times, so hopefully it'll keep your attention. Judges chapter 4, verses 4 through 24 is going to be our passage for today. And I've been practicing some of these words all week long, so we'll see how it works out with uh, some of the enunciation. The word of the Lord says this, Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take with you ten thousand men of Naphtali and Zebulon, and lead the way to Mount Tabor. I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots, and give his troops and his troops to the Kishon River, and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Very well, Deborah said, I will go with you. But because of the way you are going about this, the honor will not be yours. For the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kedesh, where he summoned Zebulon and Naphtali. Ten thousand men followed him, and Deborah also went with him. Now Heber the Kenite had left the other Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree in Zananim near Kadesh. When they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera gathered together his 900 iron chariots and all the men with him from Harosheth Hagoyim to the Kishon River. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down, went down Mount Tabor, followed by 10,000 men. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword. And Sisera abandoned his chariot and fled on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Harosheth Her- Hagoyim. All the troops of Sisera fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Sisera, however, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, because there were friendly relations between Jabin, of king of Hazor, and the clan of Heber the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in, don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she put a covering over him. I'm thirsty, he said, please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone here, say no. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground and he died. Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So he went in with her and there lay Sisera with the tent peg through his temple, dead. On that day, God subdued Jabin, the Canaanite king, before the Israelites. And the hand of the Israelites grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, the Canaanite king, until they destroyed him. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer once again? Heavenly Father, prepare our hearts for your word today. Calm our hearts before you by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. Allow us to meet with you today. Allow us to experience you. May you not just be pages on the words of a book. God, we ask through your Spirit that you would work in our hearts and souls to mold us and shape us, to prepare us into the people and individuals that you would have us become for your honor and glory and for your purpose. And God, as we work through this passage today, may the words that are spoken from this this pulpit be honoring to you. Be true to your intended meaning for us. And may they be words that fundamentally change who we are. May your words inspire us to action in our lives. 
That's really your purpose and your design for us. It's not just to come and sit here and listen, but to go and do. So to that end, may you be honored and glorified in our lives and in the lives of this congregation today. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so you guys are in for a treat today. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe, maybe I'll have everybody migrating over here so you can leave without me seeing you. Um, as, I, as I looked at this message, this message is on paper the longest message I have ever presented to you. <laughs> it is eight pages long. Now, I don't think it's going to be the longest time-wise, so you're in luck there, but I'm just throwing that out there. If it does work out that way, then so be it. Um, you're getting your money's worth on a holiday weekend. Here's what we're doing. It's been a little bit of a, if you, obviously, you know, we're not, we're not in Hebrews anymore, chapter 6. We jumped to the book of Judges. We've been in Hebrews for the month of, of August. We're now in September. In September, we're starting a new mini-sermon series, and it's called The Expendables. And here's what I'm doing. I, I, one of my favorite chapters in all of scriptures is Hebrews chapter 11. It's the, the Hearers of Faith chapter, if you will. And if you go through the Hearers of Faith chapter, there's a lot of names in there that you recognize, right? A lot of the big ones. You, you could throw out Noah and, and Moses and, and David. You could throw out uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. We, we, we know those names. They're easily recognizable. And then you've got some of the interim names. The names that you recognize, you can put with a place or an event or a time or an occurrence. Like Gideon. And we throw out the name Gideon. We don't remember everything about what Gideon done. Maybe we remember that he was an army general. But we associate him with the fleece, right? The laying out of the fleece. God make the fleece wet and the ground dry. And then God make the, the fleece dry and the ground wet. You know, we know Samson because of his strength and his feats of strength. Or we know, um, you know, Samuel, a prophet, a priest who led a nation. He was the one who appointed the first two kings of the nation of Israel. But then there's the ones that we don't so readily recognize. The Barak, the Jephthah, the Rahab. And, and I would hope you recognize Rahab's name a little bit because we talked about her a couple years ago during our Christmas messages. Yay! Right, Y'all remember that? Talking about Rahab over Christmas? It was outstanding when we worked through the genealogy of Matthew chapter 1. Right? But, but what about Jephthah? What about Barak? What about these other names that we just don't think of or, or really know hardly anything about? We don't know much about them. That's why I want to talk about them. I want to talk about the significant moments in their lives. What is it about their lives that makes them included in this Heroes of Faith chapter? We can't just ignore the fact that they're there and know nothing about them. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm going to be upfront honest with you today. I struggled greatly putting this message together this week. I had four or five pages full of notes that made absolutely no sense whatsoever. There was no connection. There was no, there was no congruity between the message. I just couldn't get to come together. And as a pastor, you'll have weeks like this. I get that. And I understand it, right? Like many of you, I'm busy in my life, and you could argue that maybe my focus is waning a little bit. You probably would be. The kids were back to school this week, so you had to deal with all the mess of that. Volleyball season is now in swing, whatever swing it's in. You know, we're still doing the COVID thing, although we feel like we're not at times. And it's just going, where is life? And so like many of you, my thoughts are all over the place, even when I'm trying to prepare from time to time. So here's what I couldn't get to match. As I was preparing this message, there was one concept that just kept eluding me. One concept that I couldn't make any sense of and one concept that I couldn't figure out. I couldn't understand the why. I couldn't understand the why. Why is this man, why is this man Barak being listed in the Heroes of Faith chapter with all these other people when all we have to go on him is found in Judges chapter 4, the verses in the passage that I read to you today. And, and if you're thinking, look in the, the rest of the Bible for other contexts about his life, for other passages about his life, I can't. That's all we know about him. What I read to you is it. That's all we have to go on. So why is this one incident make him worthy of being counted to hearers of faith? I just couldn't figure it out until we were driving home from Lancaster last night. We went down uh, to Lancaster finally had a, a funeral service for Laurie's grandmother, and as we were driving home at about 8 o'clock at night, and I was sitting in the car, um, it started coming to me. I, th I, I think I finally started understanding, and, and that's tough, because as a pastor, you don't want to be formulating a sermon at 8 o'clock the night before, although, talking to some of Laurie's family members who are also pastors and driving home to Roanoke, they were going to be doing the same thing. However, 
<laughs> with that being said, I was reflecting on a conversation I had. It was yesterday afternoon with one of Laurie's relatives, who just so happens to be one of my favorite people in the world. He's a guy that you look forward to seeing. You know, you just connect with him. He, he's sincere, he's genuine, and he's absolutely hilarious. And what he was doing is he was telling me about an experience that he had had almost two years ago. You see, two years ago, he went on a missions trip down to Central America for 10 days. And it wasn't a missions trip like you and I envision missions trip. That's what made it so special. He didn't go down to Central America to build buildings or to, to, to tear down stuff and build stuff or, or repaint stuff or drywall or do anything like that. They didn't go down there to feed people or clothe people. And they didn't go down there to put on a VBS for children or things that we would normally associate with a missions trip. This was a missions trip like I had never heard of in my life. It was four men from four different countries. One from the United States, one from Mexico, one from Cuba, and one from the native country in which they were in. And I'm going to try and keep the details to a minimum today as far as names and places because they weren't supposed to be doing what they were doing according to the laws of the government. What they were doing is they were trekking through the jungle for 10 days, going from tribe to tribe, sharing the message of Jesus. That's it. They carried all their supplies in backpacks on their back. What they had to go on that week. When they would get to a tribe or to a village, they would eat whatever was placed before them. Now, they did have some of their own provisions. I know talking to this man, he carried some cliff bars and some beef jerky. But during these 10 days, he still lost 11 pounds just being in the jungle and sweating. And, and when you get to a village, to be able to speak to the village, to be able to have the authority to speak to them and to share the gospel of Jesus, he said that you would have to partake of what was put in front of you. And the normal um, drink that was given to them is a drink called chicha. And many of you have never heard of it. And many of you are never going to, you're probably going to wish you never heard of it after I tell you what chicha is. Chicha is actually a fermented drink that's made from the yucca plant. And the way that chicha is made is the women of the village will take the yucca plant, put it in their mouths, chew on it, and spit into a bowl. And they will continue to do this until the bowl is filled. And then once the bowl is filled, they will set it aside until it ferments into an alcoholic beverage. So when you get to a village and they teach you a bowl, a communal bowl, is passed around, you must take a sip to have the authority to speak. Now my friend did mention to me that if you are drinking it, like if you have the bowl and you're doing it yourself, you can fake it till you make it sometimes, right? Like you can, you can kind of like not open your mouths and act like you're drinking. But there are other villages you go to that a tribesman will hold the bowl in front of you and tip it for you. And I want to go as far as to tell you that some of the stuff that he ended up with in his mouth, but it was not pleasant, right? They had to work their way from village to village. Right? And what I mean is they would speak at one village and before they went to the next village, a representative from the village that they were just at would go to the next village and tell them about these four men and say they have a message and something they want to share with you. Will you hear from them? The reason they had to do it this way is because if they didn't, if they just showed up at the next village, they would likely be killed. Especially my friend. You see, being an American and being the only white man that these people have literally ever seen, they've heard stories of white men and stories of Americans, and all the stories that they've heard of Americans and of white men are that they come to that area for two things. They're either prospecting for oil or for gold. And so when they come into an area, they will look for oil and gold, they will drive out the tribes that live there and just destroy their land. So when they see a white man, their instinct is to kill the white man. So he was literally having his life taken into his hands. If they would just show up at the village, they would be in trouble. In fact, there was one of the villages he shared with me about that they went to. And the four of them were sitting, and the head tribesman called their, um, the national from the group down, who was the interpreter. And they, the two of them were meeting, and the man took his guitar with him. Now this man had been praying for a guitar. And as he took the guitar down and they were meeting and they were talking, this man felt the need to start singing. So he broke out a songbook. They had eight songs that they would sing that they knew the nationals knew the words to. 
right? Or they didn't know the words to, but he had them written. And so he just broke out his guitar and he started singing. And the head tribesman actually started singing along. He said, do you have any words? And he showed him the words, so he started singing along. And then he started calling some of the other people from the village down, and they all started singing along. The men started singing. And then they called everybody down and said, okay, you now have the authority to speak to the village. This was a big deal. And the reason it was a big deal was because what they found out later is when the head, the head of the tribe called their translator down to talk to them, he called them down to tell them that they were going to kill them. What makes the story even more miraculous is the only reason the man had a guitar is because before my friend left for his trip, he has uh, two daughters who are college age, about graduating from college, and one of, her, one of his daughter's boyfriends came up to him, he's an accomplished guitar player, and he said, I just don't know why, but I feel like God is telling me you need to take this guitar on this trip. So I'm giving you my guitar to take with you. When he got down there and he started talking to the translator, the translator told him how he's been praying for a guitar. So my friend knew he had to give him his guitar. That was the point of the trip. Because his son, his daughter's boyfriend gave him guitar, his life was spared. Like God just showed up in miraculous ways after time, after time, after time for them. And in ways that we would consider miraculous, almost biblical. Of the communities they went to, you guys have got to understand that none of them have ever heard the name of Jesus. And three quarters of the communities was giving their life to Jesus after just hearing about him for a period of time. In some of the, t some of the villages they went to, 100% of the people, including the head of the tribesmen, including the witch doctors, said, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ with my life. People have never heard the name of Jesus mentioned before. And then there's also the funny, goofy stuff. Right? The one group tried to sell him a Jaguar kitten to take home for $20. And his people were like, you can't take that to the airport. He's like, I can't get it into the U.S. either, so don't worry about it, right? Or, or the time that he took a picture and he showed me a picture of the bridge that they had to walk over a 20-foot gorge. And the first part of the bridge was like this, and the second part of the bridge was like this. And so with each person that went over, it kind of went like this to this to this. So he was the last person. And he felt it was kind of unstable, and, and so he was about four feet from the edge, so he jumped over to clear it. And after he jumped to clear it, the bridge collapsed into the ravine. And then he looked at his guide and said, how are we getting back across? To which his guide said, we're flying out of the next village, so we're good. All right? And you can hear my stories, right? It's not my stories, it's the stories of my friend. It's the stories of Laurie's relative. But does it really do it justice? Can you really wrap your mind around it? Because I can tell you, you can't. And the reason I say that is because I heard the stories firsthand from him yesterday. And it wasn't what he said. It wasn't what I just told you. It was how he said what he said. It was the passion in his voice when he spoke of an experience that happened two years ago. It was the gleam in his eyes. It was the literal tears in his eyes as he was continually talking about them, showing me pictures, showing me videos. One of the videos was one of the most powerful videos I've ever seen because it was a video from the moment that he gave the guitar to his translator who had been praying for this guitar. And his, and his translator told him, he said, look, I want you to take a video of me thanking you for the guitar. So his translator only spoke the native language, so what they had to do is native language into Spanish, Spanish into English. So there was two men on his video. And this man who had the guitar was, was saying what he said, and then the, the other man was translating it from from the native into, into English. And he was thanking him, and for about a minute, he just thanked him. At the end of this minute, this tribal man literally broke down in tears, and his translator broke down in tears. They began crying. And, and to you and me, that doesn't sound like a big deal, does it? I mean, it is. As guys, we don't like to cry. Here's why this is a big deal. These men don't cry. It's not that they don't cry. Never in the history of their people is there ever a recording of a man shedding tears. Ever. And yet this man saw the provision of God in his life and he couldn't help but cry. And when I was talking to my friend, it wasn't just what he said. It was the posture of his body. It was the countenance of his expression. It was the literal goosebumps he got from the stories he was telling me that were two years old old, but more than any and all of that, it was the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit that was at work in his life when he spoke about it. 
I can tell you firsthand, watching him, I, it's been rare in my life when I've seen somebody be that filled with the Spirit. I could tell you other stories. I could tell you stories about Lori's grandmother, the reason we were down there yesterday. I could tell you stories about her laugh. In the last 18 months of her life, for whatever reason, this woman caught the funny bug. And you could say she was losing her mind, and you may be partially correct, I don't know. But it was, it, to, the way I interpret it is, after 93 years of following Jesus, she had finally found the freedom in Christ that she had been so longing for. And when she would come up and visit, our kids couldn't wait, because they knew there was a 15-minute laugh, laugh fest coming on, where great-grandma would not be able to literally stop laughing as hard as she could for 15 minutes. Which must have given her rock-hard abs. I don't know what, right? But she just lost it. And it wasn't just our family. This is her experience with all the families. I can tell you another story about my boots and the dirt on them, right? There's a reason I don't clean the dirt on my boots. Because the dirt on my boots come from some of the most holy ground I've ever stood upon. It wasn't a holy field. It was a field in the middle of Clinton County that put the dirt on my boots. But it's holy to me because it came from a time and a place where in the midst of immense earthly pain and suffering, God showed himself faithful. At a time where I desperately needed him to come through in what was easily the most tragically beautiful experience of my life to this point. Guys, here's what I'm getting at. I can tell you all these stories till I'm blue in the face. You may be moved by them, you may not. I don't know. But you'd be moved by them if you were there and experienced them in person. I can guarantee that beyond a shadow of a doubt. And that's when I realized that that's the key to our passage today. The key to understanding this passage about Barak is not just reading them at face value and reading the black and white and the words that are on the page. It's the insertion of the Holy Spirit into this experience that makes it relevant and applicable to our lives. So with that in mind, let me read again these words found in our passage. So Barak went down to Mount Tabor, followed by 10,000 men. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword, and Sisera abandoned his chariot and fled on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Harasheth Hagoyim. All the troops of Sisera fell by the sword. Not a man was left. It can't just be words on the page. When you insert the Holy Spirit into this equation... Miracles happen. Guys, a military commander from the tribe of Ephraim, when summoned upon, pulls out one of the greatest military victories from the hands of certain defeat that this nation had ever experienced. The reason we know historically that this happened, that is not listed in scriptures, is as they went to battle, a cloud burst happened. A downpour, a massive rainfall in the Kishon Valley. Now this doesn't sound like a big deal, but over the course of history, it actually is. In 1799, in the month of April, Napoleon actually defeated the Turkish armies under similar conditions in the exact same valley. Because what happens when it rains tremendously in the Kishon River Valley area is it turns to mud. And not just any mud, but this really nasty, sticky, slimy, slippery mud. Not a big deal, is it? Until you're going overmatched into a battle against 900 chariots. Not just any chariots, but scriptures tell us that they were iron chariots, incredibly powerful. But how do iron chariots maneuver in mud? Not too well, do they? Not too well at all. Every single man in Sisera's army was struck down and killed by the armies led into battle by the power and presence of God through the Holy Spirit in this instance. And it comes across in the pages of our scriptures as a military victory, but guys, it's so much more. If we could talk to Barak and Deborah here, what would they say? What would their lives tell us? What would give them goosebumps as they went through this experience? Stories of God's faithfulness and provision? Times when they expected death, but God granted life? Maybe it's stories of being on holy ground. Maybe it's a joy and unexpressible laughter that came over them. What is lost in translation on the pages is the key to understanding Barak. So on a practical level, I must remind you that the book of Judges is a very secular book. It goes around and around and around. The Israelite people forget about God. God abandons them. 
They are oppressed and then they cry out to God. God sends a deliverer or a judge for just that time to raise them and lead them out of the oppression. And it seems like as soon as they get out of the oppression, five to ten years down the road, what do they do? They forget about it and enter this circle where they just keep going over and over. It's like a wash cycle. Right? So I want to talk about the specifics of this encounter. I want to talk about Barak. Because we must be open and honest to understanding that this passage isn't just about Barak and him alone. There's a tag team between him and this woman known as Deborah. And it's an instance where one of them could never have succeeded without the other. They needed each other to be successful in the long run. Not only did they need each other, they obviously needed God. And it's, if you read through, it's not difficult to deduce that Deborah was the higher ranking player here, right? Deborah, verse 4, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. Do you know that this is the only time in the history of Israel, and in the words of our scripture, they were led by a woman? That's right. Old Testament, old school Israel, led by a woman. There's no recorded female kings. She is the only recorded female judge. Is this just coincidence? Or is this the way that God works? Was this actually ordained by God? <laughs> I think you know where I stand, and I think I know where many of you stand on that question, don't you? If God can use a woman, especially according to the Old Testament laws that were in place, but not just the Old Testament laws, but the Old Testament perceptions that existed in the lives of many of them, what are your excuses? Because honestly, if you have any, they've just been figuratively flushed down the toilet. You don't have any. Your past? Doesn't matter. God can use you. What about the sins in your life? God can use you. If you don't believe me, wait till two weeks from now when we talk about Rahab. Your societal standing? Please. I don't think so. And we're going to revisit this over the next couple weeks because it keeps coming back, right? As these Old Testament expendables, like I like to call them, weren't ordained, they weren't qualified, they weren't set apart according to the laws of man, were they? Not in any way, shape, or form. But we don't serve a God that is bound by laws, and we don't serve a God that is bound by the expectations of man. So when God desires, God does. Are you open to his calling? Guys, we serve a God that says what? There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but all are one in Jesus Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If you belong to Christ. God can and God will use you. Period. So if you belong to Christ... Here's my challenge to you. Stop with the excuses. Please, stop with the excuses. Your excuses may ease your conscience, but they are not a tool of God. Your excuses are a tool of the enemy. Your excuses are a tool to drive you away from God and toward yourself. Your excuses are a tool to keep God from achieving kingdom work in a world that so desperately needs to hear about Jesus. Guys, Deborah could have made excuses as well, right? But she was a strong leader. We know that. Barak says so in verse 8, right? He won't agree to go except if her presence is with them. If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. We don't know his specific reasoning for, for this request. We don't know exactly why he needs Deborah to go. Was it to improve morale among the troops? Possibly. Was it a blessing of God that he was seeking? Possibly. Again, she was a prophetess. Was he just unsure of himself and maybe he didn't have a high self-esteem? Wanted confirmation? Maybe. Right? As a prophetess, Deborah, Deborah would have had this incredibly intimate relationship with God. Again, she was the only judge of Israel that we know to be a prophet as well. Another special standing. Maybe we should be talking about Deborah today, right? Maybe I'll add it on to the end of the month, right? But her requested presence by Barak took an incredible step of faith on his part. But it's also 
acknowledged as a shortcoming. Because what's she saying in verse 9? I will go with you, but because of the way you are going about this, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. Barak had a lack of faith. And you know what? God still used him. Do you guys hear where I'm coming from here? I'm pointing my head around the show. I'm going around. I'm probably off the screen a little bit. I really don't care. Right? He had a lack of faith. And God still used him. Don't give me excuses. We all have lack of faith at times in our lives. God still wants to use you for His purpose and for His kingdom. Look at what is recorded at the end of this passage. It says this, the last verse. On that day, God subdued Jabin, the Canaanite king, before the Israelites. And the hand of the Israelites grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, the Canaanite king, until they destroyed him. It was this instance in battle where Barak chose to go in. He chose to be obedient, even if he didn't want to. And he led the chosen people of God to being ultimately freed from the hand of the Canaanites. Without him, the Israelites may have never achieved God's purpose for them as a nation. That is the importance of faithfulness. Guys, what if the same were true in your life? I ask this question because I believe it to be true. Will your faithfulness to God through the Holy Spirit allow God's purposes to be achieved on earth today? That's a hard question to ask. And I hope and I pray that it causes you to look inward as it does me. Would your faithfulness to God through the Holy Spirit allow for God's purposes to be achieved in our world today? Think about it. But as you think about it, I want to tell you a little bit about Barak. Because the one thing we know for sure about him is the meaning of his name. The meaning of the name Barak is Thunderbolt. And got to be honest, I think that's a pretty cool meaning for a name. Like, my name is Scott. So I looked up the word Scott. What is the meaning of the name Scott? Hold on to your edge of your seats here, because this is powerful stuff, right? You ready? From Scotland. <laughs> right? The alternate meaning is wanderer. Now, guys, would I rather be called a wanderer or a thunderbolt? I think the answer is pretty cut and dry there, isn't it? Right? I, I don't know exactly what a thunderbolt is, but here's what I think a thunderbolt is. It's a cross between a strike of lightning and a clout, clap of thunder that happen almost simultaneously, right? Have you ever been in a thunderstorm? You're like, man, this is getting near. And all of a sudden, you hear and you see the lightning bolt, and you hear it almost simultaneously. What happens when you have that experience? Hopefully, you don't pee your pants a little bit, although that is a possibility, right? You jump, you gasp, and you go, <gasps> where's it at? Because when you have that experience, your mind and your body go into this mode of what you know to be true. I'm not in a good place right now. Am I safe? Right? I may be in a little trouble when I hear a thunderclap. Now, there's a race I've probably mentioned, I, I definitely have mentioned it. A couple years ago, three years ago, at the running of the Eastern States 100 Miler, which ends and starts in Waterville, Pennsylvania. At about mile 60, I believe it is, they're running a plateau, a high plateau, up on top on the Black Forest Trail. And I know there was a handful of runners, probably 10 to 20 runners, that when they were on that high plateau, which lasts for a couple miles, a massive thunderstorm went through. And when I say massive thunderstorm, when I talked to, to two people who were up there, they said, Scott, it was like nothing I've ever experienced before. Like, like, you don't understand. And it almost seemed like a, like a straight line wind that just kept going and going. But normally in a thunderstorm, what do you do? They say, stay away from high poles and trees and, you know, don't get, get down. In, well, there's nowhere to get down in a ditch when you're up on a high plateau. And what the people I talked to said they were doing is they were actually finding the strongest, sturdiest trees they could possibly find. And they were just grabbing them or hiding behind them. Because they couldn't tell where the lightning was coming from because it was coming all around them. And it was blowing so hard that the little trees were getting blown over, rendering the trails almost impassable. So it wasn't about staying on the trail. It was a survival moment. Right? Until this thing passes, it's simply survival. And most, they all did, so that's good. A couple of them 
actually dropped out of the race once they got to the next checkpoint because they said, look, I'm doing good, but this thing ain't worth my life. They were just that frightened by the experience. Guys, that kind of storm can be incredibly unpredictable, but also incredibly powerful. Right? I bring that up because we don't know exactly the personality of Barak. But we can surmise some things by his nickname, can't we? Or by the meaning of his name. Because meanings of the names in the Bible hold a great weight to them. He probably had a commanding personality. There's a reason that Deborah chose him to go into battle, which is why I believe she was a little bit surprised when he said, only if you go with me. He was obviously powerful in battle. He was a fierce warrior. He was faithful to the leading of God in his life. Even when he questioned his own abilities, he still ultimately followed where the Holy Spirit led him. And here's another thing that's really fascinating. The word in verse 15 that is used in the original Hebrew Scriptures for the reaction of Sisera's army upon encountering um, Barak in battle is the same word in Scriptures that is used to describe the Egyptian army when they were crossing the Red Sea as on dry ground behind the Israelites and the waters started to come in upon them. And that word means extreme panic. The Canaanite armies were overwhelmed by the armies of God or the armies of the Israelites, working together. And they had this basically moment, this every man for himself type of moment. Right? Now, I don't know if you saw this or not. There's a video, I saw it on the news last week, and I looked it up again because I wanted to watch it because it was pretty wild. So it's floating around the internet of a Coast Guard ship in the Pacific Ocean. And they had this really unique experience. Basically, they had, it was a bigger Coast Guard ship, and I don't know exactly where in the Pacific, in the Pacif Pacific, in the Pacific Ocean. It was, it was, I think, late afternoon. They had finished all of their daily duties, and they had about two hours. And so I guess they do what Coast Guard people do at that point, and they went for a swim. And, and when you do that in the middle of the ocean, you have to take into account a lot of factors, so they're incredibly... They had a lot of safety measures in place. They put one of their smaller boats about 50 yards from the main ship. So if people started getting tired, they could swim to the smaller boat. Um, you had to go in pairs of twos. You can't swim by yourself. So if something happens to somebody, everybody knows about it. They had a person up on top of the deck that was their shark spotter. They had all sorts of safety measures in place. And they're out swimming. And guys, it looks like a big party in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. If, if there's even some inflatable unicorns, like the ones you sit inside, right? Big, tough Coast Guard guys sitting in inflatable unicorns. But then what would be one of our worst case scenarios that we can imagine happens. As they're out there floating around, and the video from the deck of the ship shows, somebody goes, shark! And points in the water, and there's a six to eight foot shark. They think it was either mako or thresher shark heading directly towards the swimmers. Now, fortunately, they are semi-prepared for these instances, and they have a shark spotter, a man with a gun, on the top level. And the goal of this person is not to shoot the shark, but to redirect the shark. So with, so with incredible accuracy, that's exactly what he does. Boom, 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 boom. Five shots right in front of the shark. The shark swims away. The shark comes back. It's about, I don't know, three to four minutes video until everybody gets on one of the ships. Nobody is injured. But if you're in the, if you're, if, think about you. I don't want to think about Coast Guard people. Think about you, if, or think about me. If I'm in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and I'm swimming leisurely swimming, somebody goes, Shark, what is your reaction? I, you know, like, I like to think I'm a tough guy. I like to think I would, re you know, react admirably. Um, I'm pretty sure I'd be swimming over anybody and anything in my way to get to the closest boat. To the point of if they're halfway up to the outer, using them as a ladder and yanking them back down in. Right? This, this is not something I want to experience. Right? Fortunately, they all survived. Right? There's a tense and life-threatening situation, and there's a decision to be made. And what we call it is the fight-or-flight syndrome, right? What do you do? And it's obvious that in this battle, the Canaanite army did what? They flew. We are out of here. I don't care what we have to do. We are running away. We are getting away as fast as I could. Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Harasheth the Goyim. All the troops of Sisera fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Sisera, however, fled on foot to the tent of Jael. They fled for their lives, but they fled in terror of the armies of Israel advancing on them by a thunderbolt of a leader and the Lord God fighting on their behalf. Guys, how would your life look different if you lived it 
as though your name was Thunderbolt and the Lord your God was fighting on your behalf. If you truly lived and believed that God ordained your life for a purpose, and I know we say that we believe that, and we say that we live it, but I'm calling bull because I don't think we do. I think too often it's just words that we use, and it's not a heart condition that we live with. If you truly lived and believed that God goes before you in the battles of your life for His glory and His kingdom purposes, how different would your life look? Guys, as a follower of Jesus, it is true. According to the word he has given us. God has given us what? God has not given us a spirit of timidity. He has given us a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord. But let us join with the Apostle Paul who calls us to do what? Suffer for the gospel. By the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done but because of the purpose and grace of God who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. There is incredible power in this story. There's incredible power in the story of the life of Barak, even if it doesn't always come across on the pages of your scripture as so. Will you allow God to work in your life? Will you allow God to work in the life of this collective church body for His kingdom purposes today? And from this point forward. These aren't questions you can answer with words. I don't expect answers. They are questions that you answer by your faithfulness to God, your openness to the Holy Spirit, and how you live your life. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? God, when we ask questions like this, they're tough. Maybe it forces us to be introspective in a way that we really don't want to be or that we're not comfortable being. And yet, it's not in our comfort zones where you do the best work. We tend to think we do our best work in our comfort zones. That's why we go there so often. But God, we don't want to work on our behalf according to our accord. We want to work for your kingdom purposes through the power and presence of your spirit. So whatever it is you need to do to us, I pray that you would push us outside of our comfort zones to that place where you can work in our lives. Barak was a great military commander and it took a woman to push him there. That's where you used him. That's why he's a hero of faith. God, we don't need to be listed in the heroes of faith. We simply want to be faithful to you. So for your power of love and of self-discipline in our lives... May we live up to that. May we live according to your purposes for your kingdom. Draw us close to you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Guys, I didn't have a closing song for today, so we're not going to sing one. So what I'm going to (laughs) do is give you the boldest, most intense, and in my opinion, greatest benediction found in all of scriptures that really isn't a benediction to begin with. But it's a benediction that can be found true in your life if you are faithful to Jesus. And it's actually a benediction that requires you to play your part in the story of Jesus Christ for His kingdom. And it's found in Hebrews chapter 11. So I would say, go in the knowledge of God in the same spirit that worked mightily in the lives of those that were found to be faithful, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle, and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, and they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. And here's the kicker. God had planned something better for us 
so that only together with us would they be made perfect. May you be challenged by God's Word and the role of your life that He has chosen for you to play. And may you go in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit today. Guys, thanks for coming. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the weather. Focus on Jesus and live like it.